Great. Thank you. Thank you. Right. I think we've got a packed house. So uh, welcome to this uh, session. It's going to be an interactive session. And as you can see, comfortably perched at the front, we have four uh, experts who will be engaging in lively debate, I hope, on some uh, interesting topics. Uh, I've got some questions for them, uh, but I will also invite you to consider questions as we go as well. My name is Charles Gould, I'm CEO of Brightwave. And before I introduce uh, the panelists, um, we're going to just set the scene a little bit. I think that's only right. Um, Brightwave, you may be familiar with. We've spent well over 10 years designing and developing learning technology solutions, mostly in the form of highly interactive multimedia courses. But over that 10 years, of course, so much has changed in the way that we use technology and consume digital media. And it's incumbent on us as leaders in this field to be always looking for what, how we can harness those new technologies and trends in order to help uh, those solutions that we offer to be more effective for the next generation of, of learners. And so we, uh, we, we've coined the term total learning and it's in reference to the fact that actually there's only a small proportion of how we learn which is done formally through courses. Uh, there's, a, there's a vast amount that we learn at events like this and all sorts of other ways and we'll explore that as we go. Um, about a year ago or, or so we launched a platform called Tesselo, which embodies many of the things that we're going to be talking about uh, during this session. Um, we're not going to demo it, this is not a sales pitch. However, if you do want to find out more about that platform and see it in action, our stand is just next to the uh, seminar here. So I'm going to ask, first of all, a colleague of mine, um, Meg Green, who's a learning consultant, Tesselo learning consultant, just to spend 10 minutes or so setting the scene, explaining what we mean by total learning, and that will then lead us nicely into the debate that we're going to have and discussion with the members on the panel. So Meg, over to you. Thank you, Charles. Um, can everybody hear me okay? I'll try and shout. Um, cultural uh, benefit of being American. Right. Um, so as Charles said, I'm just going to spend a few minutes setting the scene about what we mean to about total learning. Oh. I'm not going, I'm just getting <laughs> Already? Oh no. Um, why total learning? What is it? And why do we think it matters? And so I think at the end of the day, it, it all comes down to this, which is how do we learn at work? And I know we talk a lot about how we learn at work at conferences such as these, um, mobile, um, instant, all the rest of it. I'm going to take it back one step and actually say, what do we learn at work? And as I was preparing this uh, bit of this chat, I was asking some colleagues at, uh, around the office a question, and it was this. What was the last major thing you learned that advanced your career and, in retrospect, has been important and fundamental to your career? And uh, along those lines, once you figure out what that thing is, what prompted you to learn it in the first place? And how did you know you were doing it correctly? And so, you know, maybe if you guys have a think about this yourselves, don't worry, I won't make anybody say anything. But um, while we're going through uh, the, ch the slides, have a think about what it might mean for you. And um, I'll go through some of the trends that I found uh, in just a moment. But at the end of the day, it all comes down to this, which is, um, sorry, Abby, um, we, <laughs> we learn all the time. Um, and we learn everywhere. And we always have. Um, and um, I, I purposely, there is a computer in the back there, but I purposely kept technology out of this slide because I want to make the point that um, take technology out of the picture and it's always been the same. It's always been a blend of things that we learn formally, things we learn from mentors, things we learn from people next to us, things we just pick up all the time. Facilitated by technology, um, when you add technology into the picture, it really changes two things. And the first is the need for instant access the fact that we can get things anytime, anywhere, um, it, it's an advantage and it breeds a, an additional need. And then also, uh, it opens up the ca capability to track everything. And that's really, at the end of the day, what it comes down to. You can get to it when you want it and you can track all of it. And so, when we talk about total learning, really what we mean by that 
I'm sure most of you, um, if not all of you, are familiar with 70-20-10. So you can see where we're going here with the full 100%. We've got 10% formal learning, courses, degree, certification. You've got 20% that is led by peer-to-peer -peer interactions, stuff that you learn from colleagues, stuff you learn from mentors. And then you've got an entire wealth of information that you learn just by simply existing through your role, learning things as you go. And um, we think that it is vital to start looking at the whole picture. Again, I think because technology used to limit us a bit, we got really focused on the 10, especially when it comes to things like learning management systems. And now really um, the uh, tin can and all the rest of it has really opened up the possibilities. But um, the reason why it's important is because the lines between these are so blurred. Um, many learners often have multiple careers in a lifetime, so they might be starting in the formal track and then learn more by going informally, or might come into a role and immediately need to kind of get stuck into more of the experiential learning, maybe because there isn't a training program, maybe because they're quite senior. You know, there are lots of different reasons. And the benefit of using a framework that kind of mixes all these styles together is that um, individual learners can move back and forth depending on their need, depending on the competency type. And so the total learning system incorporates all three, but lets people move through them in a way that's personal to them and personal to their role. The organization then has the opportunity to fit a particular learning initiative um, as a formal track, either through courses um, or certification, if that's appropriate, or they can create a more informal blend of learning competencies that might be better learned on the job, um, and they get to make that choice. So, what do you need in a total learning system? And that's you in, in a couple of directions, which is what does the learner need and what does the organization need? So when I kind of come back on my themes um, that I found from my little office poll, the first thing to say is that we first need to understand the foundations of where we are. Um, and so whether that's an initial technical background, as in some of the guys I was chatting to, as a grounding, or we need a framework, uh, we need ground rules to kind of understand what we're playing in before we then try and step outside it and, and move beyond it and stretch beyond it. And um, many times the majority of learning happens outside the structure, uh, but its initial presence is really vital to the learning process and, and it's really important for organizations, obviously. Um, organizations, you need to make sure that learning is more than Googling. Um, it needs to have a center and it needs to be able to kind of um, encompass the vision of your organization um, and the main themes that you want to make sure that people are harnessing. Learners need to be kind of playing from the same rule book, basically. And this is your opportunity um, with the kind of structure to uh, ensure that consistency comes from a trusted source. And um, obviously, also, you need proof that it's done to your satisfaction, and you need to track that. Um, but very fundamentally, also, we learn from others. And overwhelmingly, the response I got back from um, my colleagues was that critical business knowledge they gained, which advanced their careers, came from other people. And um, basically, we mirror our activities on those we trust, and we look around all the time for those experts, for those people that we trust, and we mirror their behavior. Um, and um, that's you know, natural human behavior. Uh, in organizations, oftentimes, we view learners as, a, we view a trusted expert as already having that stamp of approval from the company. So we almost get the company information from those experts without really necessarily connecting that together. Um, and that's anything from fundamental te technical skills to soft skills, project management, communication especially. Um, and so when you're thinking about a, a learning system that encompasses this sort of learning activity, sometimes those colleagues are next to us and sometimes they aren't. We're, um, we're becoming more globally, uh, organizations are becoming more global. Uh, colleagues are working from home, they're not always sitting next to each other. So um, a learning system needs to facilitate that natural peer-to-peer -peer learning in um, really a world that's making it increasingly difficult to do so. Um, so that's the first step for the learner, but then the organization can look to capture that learning because uh, if you pretend the two people are sitting next to each other, it's still just those two people that learn the information. Um, broadening it out to a learning system and capturing it enables everybody to learn that information and increases that speed of competency. We learn from our mistakes. Um, yeah, so 
I'll just tell one of mine. <laughs> one very important day a few years ago, both my boss and I, which is why I don't mind saying it, um, not at this organization, I might add, uh, we learned the same lesson, which is do not do a major client rollout on a Friday afternoon before everybody goes home. It won't go well and people will get very cross. Um, and so I think, <laughs> yeah. Um, everybody has that kind of whoops moment, you know, where you make a mistake um, and it probably, most likely, made that situation very difficult. But if you think back on it, you probably, well, you learned from it. You probably made a process out of it so it didn't happen again. And um, you may have even affected the process of the organization as a whole, as we definitely did in that case. Um, and it's just a simple try, fail, repeat methodology. And it's really important to remember that um, success and learning comes from these steps. And again, if we're thinking about a, a, a learning solution and a learning system, these uh, harnessing this shouldn't be so that we say, you've made this mistake bad. Um, it, should, it shouldn't be recorded for reprimand, but so that people can then say, well, this is how it happened the first time. Now, here are the steps that I did after it. And here, look, this is what happened. Either a process change for the organization or um, I didn't do it again. Um, so tracking that knowledge will help other people not mis make the same mistake. Um, the knowledge from a mistake, as I said, can become best practice. And um, the best thing for an organization is that only one person makes a mistake and everybody else learns from it and you're not repeatedly making the same mistakes which I'm pleased to say we didn't. <laughs> so um, when discussing the question, how did you do know you were doing it correctly? This was an interesting one. Um, my colleagues mentioned two themes. Um, the first is that either they had a mentor or a manager, and it is important to say it wasn't always a manager. Sometimes it was, again, a trusted colleague. Um, reviewed it, noticed their skills, and said, hey, that's a great thing you've done, well done. So this is for more self-directed learning. Um, or that because of the new skill they learned, something else was better than it was last time. So it wasn't necessarily that somebody came up to them and said, this new skill you've learned is great, you're doing it exactly right. Um, but the learner themselves could say, oh wait, I know that that is improved now, and I know that it's better because of this thing I did, so therefore this thing I did is a useful skill that other people might um, benefit from. So a total learning system should kind of mirror these relationships, not only by kind of enabling coaching in real time and mid-activity and mid-assignment, but also to um, show learners how the practice of their skills is actually helping overall performance. And again, organizations can see how learners' self-directed knowledge and skill gaining is affecting the bottom line. And we learn in the workflow, and this is obviously a really important one. And this, this means a blend of online and offline. And I think one of, of uh, the, the biggest mistakes we sh can do is presuming that because we're technology enabled um, now as a population, that important learning doesn't happen off, uh, on, offline. It does. Um, what technology should do um, and can do is provide learners with an opportunity at the exact moment of need in the workflow to record what they've done either online or offline activities. Um, technology aids the capture and capitalization, um, but it doesn't limit where the learning comes from. And they don't, learners, we don't decide, you know, you don't sit down at your desk and say, I'm gonna do some learning now. Um, a total learning system should let you not think about what you're doing, capture it, move on, and then maybe allow you to come back and reflect later. And that's when it comes down to this, which is that we love data. Learners love data because they can see what they've done. Um, it gives them transferable skills. They can show it to their next employer. They can show it to their own employer to show them what they've been doing off their own um, self-direction. And the organization needs it. You need it to track compliance. And uh, you need it to show that your learning initiatives end up affecting um, the bottom line at your organization. So. From our point of view, all of that put together, we think that a total learning system should have four key elements. And uh, you've got your LMS, which is basically just sitting in the background, making sure everything's tracked, making sure that there's a structure, uh, a way through the material. Um, the LRS, or Learning Record Store, is what gives you that, um, the ability to harness your own learning and your own information and bring it in. Uh, the social is what makes use of that information. So you can say, well, all right, I did it, which is great for me, but now let me share it with my colleague, which is what <laughs> makes the difference for the organization. And then the curator, the subject matter experts, the people who are facilitating and monitoring, note those things. They spot the emerging experts. They harness that material and they move it. They give it that stamp of approval, put it back into the kind of the wider pot of knowledge for the whole organization so that um, the learner can see that they've contributed to that kind of um, um, intellectual property, really, of the organization. They've made a difference and the organization has that material. 
And so as you can see, this kind of um, takes the 70, the 20, and the 10 to give you your whole 100%. Uh, so why use a total learning framework? And there's some key things here in simple, and it's one place. Um, if, uh, as we mentioned, a, a learner wants to move through formal and informal activities because they're not necessarily doing one thing and then the other. You just want to be able to effortlessly capture formal, informal, and social. The learner wants to capture evidence that they've done what they're supposed to be doing, that they're moving forward in their career for CPD or for any other purpose. And the organization wants to capture that knowledge um, for benefit. So we're really thrilled to be working with quite a lot of organizations, um, as Charles mentioned, about this combination of formal and informal learning. And um, as they've all run away from uh, the slides here, I think they'll all come back now. <laughs> and uh, Charles will introduce everyone, and um, you'll get to hear their expert views on what they think about the subject, which will be really nice. I hope that's given you some food for thought. We're going to get stuck in now to uh, discussing all of that. And uh, hopefully you can become involved as well. So do you agree with what has been said? Uh, what are the implications for the <laughs> learning and development profession? <laughs> do you agree with what they uh, said? No. What might be coming next? What other things do we need yeah, to be considering? <laughs> and um, you've seen really the sort of evolution in, in a very short 10, minute, uh, 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 10 minutes of Meg's presentation, just how we've been sort of digesting some of these issues, recognizing that a very small proportion of how we've learnt is formal, but actually technology enables us to start to move into the other maybe 90%. Uh, and that's where our, our Tesla product has, has, uh, is really being positioned. It's fantastic to see some major organizations really taking it up and starting to use it. But without further ado, let's now finally uh, yes, settle back into to your seats, uh, introduce our esteemed panel. So, uh, starting at the far end, we have uh, Caroline Wormsley, who is Managing Director of Brightwave. We then have Abby Lamas from the Chartered Institute of Marketing. She's Director of Learning Innovation. We then have Andy, Andy Lancaster, who is Head of Learning and Development at the CIPD. And then we have Miles, Miles Runham, who's Head of Digital at uh, BBC Academy. So, I've got a couple of questions to kick us off. And listen, I don't want you all agreeing all the time, okay? I want to see some, some healthy debate. And if you, if you all do agree, then I'm going to ask you some really hard questions, all right? I'm going to spring some on you. All right, I've got one for, uh, perhaps I can kick off with Miles um, with this one. And, this, and my question is, in the last five years, what do you think has been the biggest shift in people's expectations about how they learn at work? Um, I think, and this is probably m last five years, but perhaps m more in the last two to three, that people's expectations are set by how they learn outside of work, and those expectations now define how people learn in work. The notion that you kind of take your learning brain out at home and then put a professional training brain on at work, I think is now undermined. I think, and I think it's, it's technology, I think it's the web that's done that, is there's so much expertise, experience and information available to all of us all of the time that we readily learn from. However, we, co we don't spend time codifying that as training or learning or development, we just naturally do it. So I think we have an expectation that that content and also a very, very intuitive and natural use of that content and those tools is available to us. And if that's turned off at work, or unavailable at work, then I think that's kind of frustrating and stressful for people. So I think there's kind of uh, the web has won out and is, is the, what we need to follow. Yeah, the risk is that people see work as, as the last source of learning how to do your job increasingly. If, that, if, you're, if we're not really smart about what we're providing as a profession, an LD profession, who would like to uh, tackle that question as well? I think you're absolutely right. Um, many people will learn in their own time very differently from how they learn at work. So I have a 90 minute commute into work and I sit next to more or less the same guy every time I go in and he's learning on his iPad. The chances are when he gets into work that there may well be a very traditional method of learning. So there's a disconnect between um, our personal learning lives and often our organisational learning lives. So I think the challenge for us is it's about connection, it's about collaboration, um, and those things are really important now. Uh, and looking back in my career, um, I used to be a course creator, I used to be an instructional designer, whereas now it's more about facilitation and connecting people. And that's a 
very, very different challenge for us, a very different skill set. So um, it's shifting fast. The world of work is moving incredibly fast, and I think L&D needs to move incredibly fast too. And you've got a particular interest in uh, how the L&D professional is going to respond to all of this. We'll come, we'll probably we'll come, come back, back to that, that one, yeah. later. Anybody else who, uh, on our panel who would like to tackle that one? Thank, Abby. Thank you, thank you Charles. Um, this is from a different perspective, is, is that um, not only do the, myself, I have to be concerned about how I'm learning it outside the work and inside work, but also my work has to embrace how I'm learning. So no longer can I be fed um, L and D in the normal, in the in the sort of um, old-fashioned way that I sit in a in a class or um, have training in the normal way um, to develop my own profession. But I can actually find out about stuff quicker than my employee can tell me about stuff. So that has to be embraced as well. So as L&D professionals, we need to be embracing and capturing that very fact that your employees can find out about learning and can learn stuff quicker than you can probably curate it. We've got a question here from the audience. Actually, I'll, I'll give you the microphone because it's so cl close to me. That's a very good observation. So how we should react once knowing that our employee will potentially even learn faster than we may deliver the content? I think you, you need to be helping them have the confidence to be able to do that rather than fight it, um, actually embrace it and help them embed it um, as an as employee um, and share it. That's really important, the actual community aspect of that as well. So, but hold on, are we, are we saying that um, we're bypassing what our employer can offer us in terms of learning and development support? Is, are we not going to be able to... Is there no place for sort of formal courses anymore? I think there is obviously place for courses, informal and formal learning from your employer, but they have to also um, take into account the very fact that there, there is immense amount of learning out there I mean I go to the doctors let's face it I expect every single person in this room has gone to the doctors at some point and the doctors said to them they've got something wrong with them some, some something or you've had a symptom of, um, of a, a, you know a, a, an issue or a problem or ill health and you've gone on the internet and you've gone I don't know um, you know I've got I've got a rash or I've got a sore throat and you go and find out yourself and then you go down the doctors and you say to the doctors, I think I've got so-and-so. And the doctor actually thinks, oh great, yeah, you've been on the internet. And um, I don't know how many people have actually done that, but I've done it loads of times. So the internet and you know, just having information in front of us has, has totally changed the way we learn, like you say, but it's also made the learner the the um, the expert because they're in control of their learning only they know what they know so as L&D experts what we've got to do is facilitate that capture it um, give them the confidence to share it with others and I think that's an enormous enormous um, role that employers can play okay now um, those changing learner expectations of course are very important to Brightwave and so I wonder, Caro, what, what's, what are your views about those, those changing expectations and then maybe how you know, we will respond to that? Well, um, any of the bright waivers who are in the audience will probably uh, tell you that uh, I'm quite a demanding person. Um, I'm quite demanding in my work life. I'm quite demanding in my home life. I try and do it politely, obviously. Um, but I'm demanding as a learner as well. And I don't just want to uh, think about what I can learn for my organisation, I want to know what I can learn from my organisation as well. I think uh, learning and development is changing into more of a two-way street than perhaps it was previously the case. Um, I think particularly with millennials now entering the workforce, they have more demand. So in addition to Abby's point about content still needing to be relevant and authoritative and it being available on the point of need, uh, I also think there's um, a demand from learners, they're becoming more discerning in what they're demanding. 
Sorry, Charles, I'm, I'm in danger of violently agreeing, which isn't perhaps what, you, what you'd intended. But I, th I think there's something, there's something happening or something needs to happen in organisations where a lot of the application of technology for learning but also of training, learning and development has been solving the problems the organisation has or the problems as the organisation sees it. But how are we going to make these people learn? And I think that is either flipping or needs to flip. So it's actually you need to allow people to, to have control over what they need to learn because they need to get something done. I don't think that means that departments back off that, but you need to you need to prepare yourself for you know allowing people to take control of what you do more than laying it out there and you know creating a learning path, etc. I think it's that there's that tension at play. Okay, sure, but in the end, you're paid by your employer. Your employer has business objectives. They need people, their employees to perform probably according to certain standards that they set down and possibly in a consistent way. So doesn't that mean there's still a need for that top-down sort of conveyance of knowledge from employer to or the source of authority to the uh, employee? Yeah, I know, I think it does. Um, but I think that the point, I suppose, what we need to try and achieve is that we offer offer and allow people to learn in a way that's relevant to, them, to themselves and it has to be individually and personally relevant that shouldn't and probably doesn't and it would be dangerous if that meant do you know whatever you like because you know that would be uh, untargeted and problematic and none of us would want to invest in that but so but i think that what is relevant needs to be defined by your context in the organization not only by therefore by learning and development or training teams but also by line managers by you know company objectives etc and it's that I but I think it's that target of yeah. relevant learning that, that might help answer it yeah so the importance of good management I think becomes really relevant there doesn't it um, but as I, I think we'd probably most of us would agree that as knowledge workers we, we we tend to see formal training particularly things like compliance e-learning as just a necessary evil and actually our jobs mean that we have to solve problems Form, make, make our own judgments about things on a day-to-day, hour-to-hour basis. And uh, you know, the question which we'll come back to is how, how can we, as L&D people, help or facilitate that using technology, ideally? So I've got a second question which starts to move into that, and this is one for you to start with, Andy. So if we've accepted that these are some of the challenges for L&D, um, what do we expect for learning and development professionals? And um, wh what do you think, because you, 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 you're, you are the body that represents learning and development, so what do you think your members are going to have to do, and what, what will their how will their role change, which we're already seeing, aren't we? Yeah. There is absolutely um, a place for a modern learning and development department and function. Um, you probably would say I would say that, but um, I wouldn't be in the job if I didn't believe that to be the case. Uh, the challenge is that we need to adapt and change quite fast right now. So there's lots of things you can say, but I've got an ABC for um, just to kind of hang some thoughts on. Um, we need to A, acknowledge that we need to start learning ourselves quickly. Um, probably most people here are early adopters and love this kind of stuff, but there's a whole profession who are struggling right now to adapt quickly to what's going on. So we have learning and development needs. Some recent research we did at CIPD with Towards Maturity showed that less than half the profession engage in professional development. And that's a real shocker and a real concern. So I think we've got to take it very seriously now. We've got to professionalize. Uh, we can no longer stay where we are. Um, I noticed my watch has stopped. Um, it's quite a nice watch, isn't it? It's quite a good one. My watch has stopped, uh, and as I was coming in today, I noticed that was the case, and L&D departments who are frozen in time are going to struggle. Okay, so maybe that's a little prophetic thing to, to show today. B, we need to be business aligned. Um, we are not always aligned to the business, so to come back, do we add value? The reason is sometimes we've not got close enough to what the business needs, so we must be learning professionals who understand what the core drivers are for, for performance improvement. And lastly, on C, I think we need to get far more around collaboration, around connection, and less around course creation. So I think there's a real change in our emphasis about what we actually do now. So um, it's about creating a learning environment in which people can have personal learning, but organizational ones as well. So I think we're changing fast. We've just written a new suite of qualifications because our old CIPD qualifications were proving to be out of date. 
so that's good news but we recognize there's a whole range of new skills coming in I'm not going to push those today but just to say we need to gen up very quickly in terms of our learning and develop knowledge and experience and it's great to see that CAIPD is mm -hmm. is really sort of recognizing that Absolutely. and making a change and you know, your members will have probably, those of them who have been in their careers for a while, will be seen as purveyors of training courses. And, uh, and that's what they are expected to do, and that's what they're skilled at doing. But I agree with you. I mean, we're seeing, we're seeing opportunities for learning and development professionals to ad adopt new skills like um, community management for online social learning. A real concern for us, um, for the marketing sector, is that digital marketing has come on the scene. It's come on the scene really, really, really fast. And we haven't, we, we weren't ready at all as a, as a sector. We weren't ready. So we've got um, a handful or a fairly large pool, I would say, now of digital marketers or data scientists that are moving, um, are moving and shaking the sector. However, that they are a handful and so much, so many times now am I talking to CMOs and CEOs of, com of marketing organisations or big corporate organisations who are recruiting graduates with better um, digital knowledge than the recruiter. So the recruiter doesn't actually know whether the person they're recruiting is actually any good because they don't understand what they're recruiting. So we've got a massive, there's a massive gap just in there alone in that recruiters that, you know, and I'm talking the sort of, you know, the older recruiter doesn't understand our, our digital youth. Um, you know, for example, the other day I recruited um, a young person into my team and the person I recruited them from, it was an internal recruitment, and the person I recruit, the director I recruited it, it, the, that person from, said to me, that person has no digital skills. They can't use the computer. Because that person, their boss, had only ever seen, seen them work in hospitality, so they'd never used a computer. She's 19 years old. Of course she can use a computer, it goes without saying. And of course we sat her in front of the computer Monday and she's amazing. So, you know, that's just a really ridiculous thing to say and to think. And, but that is the problem, is that a lot of L&D, um, well, a lot of you know, employers are still there. They're, they're still believing that digital isn't coming um, and it's not, it's not, it's not for real. Um, and so I think there's a there's a real real disconnect there. Yeah, I think you're right, um, Miles. Y uh, y I wouldn't I wouldn't necessarily describe you as a career L and D professional, but you do work with L and D people. You do manage. You have a team of, of L and D people. What what what's your view? I think <coughs> I suppose well, I'm not a career L and D person, and that's you know neither here nor there perhaps. But I, I think what there are a few examples of the kinds of skills that the learning and development organization is going to have to look to to try and get this right and I think they aren't within the HR world though so and I think this is one of the challenges is you kind of tend to, everybody tends to look within the closer functions and we would tend to work with operations finance HR those are our kind of you know, closer cousins in a corporation I think a lot of the answers that we need to look for are outside of that so I think the d digital advertising industry is is where is the most exciting and useful application of data for a commercial ends they gather you know and store and react to an enormous amount of information very very quickly very smart use of very very immediate sets of data it's quite interesting examples there the other I think the other area and we're trying to do this so I've set up a team uh, which we call the product management team is to is to borrow this is partly the kind of Silicon Valley um, example where we're trying to manage the life cycle of digital products and products that are designed well for, to meet a user need, and then we'll develop them, maintain them, manage them, and then hopefully shut them down when they're not working anymore. And that mindset of how to manage and develop digital products is quite new and different, I think. It's very different from the kind of corporate enterprise IT that we often deal with. So I think there's a kind of couple of examples there. Just a couple of thoughts. Um, we need to look at upward mentoring. So when we talk about mentoring programs, often we're talking about senior staff 
uh, mentoring more junior staff. So we need to start thinking about younger people upwards mentoring more established employees. And I tried that at a, a, a previous organization where some of our apprentices were brilliant at inducting and helping with social media skills. So that's one thing. And I think as well, Abby, I, I've noticed that um, uh, I, I kind of work for another charity working with kids who are on the edge and um, digital poverty is very, very clear out there. Not everybody has access to the internet and we can assume that everybody does. So I was on the train the other day and um, a very quick story, young girl said to her dad, um, I don't want to go down the library tonight because they don't have the books which we need. And he said, well, I can't afford to give you a laptop or, a, or an iPad. And we sat there and there's a few of us eyeballing on the train uh, coach about this. So she said, the thing about the library is it's rubbish is because I can never learn what I need to learn. So I would stick my neck out to say that access to modern media and technology is becoming a human right and not just something for those who can have it. So I think we've really got to think through about how we bring young people in with great digital skills, but how we use those within organizations to mentor the CEO. Uh, and I think that's a really exciting prospect to have upwards mentoring. So, Just to come back on that, I think um, for L&D professionals, the organisation also has a responsibility as well. So I think, you know, increasingly, um, L&D, or traditionally, L&D professionals, their job's been to implement business strategy. I think if you've got a smart organisation that's looking at their learning and development strategy, not just being fed from the top down, but actually this two-way street, you end up with L&D sort of at the forefront of being able to unlock potential in their organisations, not just measure performance. So I think with that, you end up with um, L&D professionals actually being in a position where they can shape an organisation's strategy. And I think, that's, I think that's key. I would like to see more of that uh, happening. Okay. Well, before we move off this quite important topic, I wonder if there are any... Um, if anybody's got a question or a comment about the changing role of learning and development professionals. I mean, there may be... I'm sure there are people who are facing some of those challenges here. If you do, just put your hand up any time and I'll come back to you. Um, but I'd like to move on... Um, ah, just in the nick of time. Let's say that we have got a question. During uh, the discussion, it's clear that we are moving with the new media to that uh, 20 and 70 percent of how people learn how the traditional instructor who was taking care about that 10 percent in the past should now influence that 20 and 70 percent uh, assuming that he's even external from the perspective of organization where he is uh, teaching great so what you're really saying is if we accept the premise of 70 20 10 We've got, uh, in L&D, a team of people who are um, skilled at instructional design and delivering that 10%. So what is it that they do or need to do? I'm even asking, let's imagine that this L&D department in company X is hiring the company Y in order to provide some uh, training which normally will fit in that 10% rule uh, do you see based on the technology you know that technology is definitely changing the, the way how we may approach 20 and 70 do you see also the ways how the company way in my example may influence that 20 and 70 percent of the learning time by sending instructor and not sending him as an instructor, but mentor and whatever else. Now that, that's, a, that's a very relevant, really good question. And I think it go, goes back to actually what, what I mentioned earlier about some of the skills and uh, uh, abilities that learning and development people could adopt to make themselves more relevant and more capable of supporting that 20 and 70. So, for example, the ability to manage a, a, an online social learning community. You know, how do you seed... The, that, that sense of collaborative learning? How do you encourage people to share knowledge? So there's a skill there, which is not about making courses. Equally, curating, I mentioned that earlier, curating um, knowledge that exists in all sorts of different formats. It doesn't necessarily need to be instructionally designed into a course. That's a skill that, that uh, L&D people, I think, could be really looking at and, uh, and making them, to make themselves more relevant and stretching beyond just that 20%. Any other comments about that? 
Thank you. We need to learn in the way our learners learn. Um, so one of the primary tools for learning right now is Twitter. And I still meet L&D professionals who say it's an irrelevance to be on Twitter. So I think there's a real challenge for us to adopt and embrace those new learning, learning methods. And I think personal learning networks are crucial. I think how do you learn these skills? Well, you, you get around other professionals who are doing it well. And I think companies who only outsource are putting themselves in a dangerous position because um, savvy companies will embed some of these skills within their own staff as well. So I think it's a mix of both. Um, but we need to be out there at the front of it. Um, so, uh, you know, we're tweeting up here as we're, well, I'm not tweeting too well because I've got too many things in my hands, but we need to be modeling those skills ourselves. I think as we do that, we have a chance to influence the 70 and 20 as well. So I'd still come back. I think personal learning networks, professional development, changing our thinking radically is really essential for L&D professionals. Just to come back on your point, as a, uh, as a provider, bright a provider of, of, of learning solutions and formal courses, I think there is still a place for the 10% within an organisation. I think it's just what that 10% is composed of will, will change. And actually, it may not be a formal course requirement in every case going forward. I think organisations have a wealth of resources in-house that they may, they may want to use to, to deliver to their learners. So I think the 10% will remain, but the construct of it might be different. Yeah, I think that's a good point. In fact, we're, we are actively moving towards things like learning pathways, which are, they're actually, they're, there's an instructional design element to them, but what they are really is sequences of different resources that have been stitched together for a particular purpose. They can be do, done so really dynamically, very, very quickly. And that kind of skill is slightly different from the instructional design skill of creating a course. Right. Let, I was okay. just going to say, I think we're risk adverse sometimes in L&D. I think we need to get out there a bit and take some risks. So CIPD, we've traditionally done face-to-face -face courses. Our new L&D quals, we're going to do 100% digitally. And there's a risk about this and there's a challenge and we, we haven't been this way before. So I think companies need to, to have risk takers around. And I think you make some mistakes, but most of the learning, the best learning comes through making mistakes. And I know some mistakes are really business critical and you can't go there. But most mistakes we can learn from those. So I, I think we need to get a bit more edgy in L&D. Um, you know. Good. Yes, absolutely. Good. So, I, like, I, like, I like that. Well, look, let's look ahead. So well, I think we all, we, we all kind of no really don't we that we learn informally we learn using our smartphones using google using our social networks but let's look ahead and i want to ask what new technologies or or trends in digital media do you see on the horizon that we may we may be uh, needing to anticipate and think about as we consider learning development in the future that's quite a hard one so um i'll give you a minute to think about it does anyone want to want to have a crack at it i've i've got i've got, go, I've got go the microphone so i'll i'll dive in and, and and make some predictions which anybody who meets me within the next 45 minutes can say that didn't happen or or longer i think i'm i'm becoming dangerously obsessed with this notion of data and information i big data no because i think i think big data is a misnomer and, and unhelpful big data is for organizations like facebook and google who are dealing with literally billions of of moments and transactions. For most organizations, even large ones, it's hundreds of thousands. It's relevant data and the joining up of data from different sources, freeing ourselves from the learning management system. I think that's a really important thing is to be able to say the learning management system is one source of data but not the only source of data. So I think there's something about engineering data streams together that help us plan and help us reflect back to people who are learning. How did that go? Who else is doing that? what content comes next in your pathway example so, you, so you're making use of that data to improve what you offer in yeah. to support learning i think i think done properly and i don't know how to do this properly but but we're, we're struggling to find that out at the moment within the bbc it the, the the proper use of that data will help us to design learner experiences courses or whatever that that are more useful and more relevant but it will also help learners understand where they are contextually so what's, what have they just done, what's coming next, and where they are in a social community as well. So who else like, you know, is learning similarly or, uh, and joining up those things? I think that's really important. But I don't think that's one big data engine, one, you know, one ring to rule them all, I think, is, is folly. I think we need to get smarter at using different data sets and bringing them together. I, I, I completely agree with you. I think we'll look back and see 
even things like our Tesla, which we think fan is fantastically ahead of the curve, in a few years' time, it will be quite a rudimentary example of how we're using social media to enable people to find the right experts and solve the problems that they have Im instantly. Um, any other, dis any violent disagreements? Um, <laughs> I don't know if it's a violent disagreement. I'm going to launch myself at miles, but. Um, for me, I think as, a, as an industry, we're very quick to sort of, you know, what's new, what's next? You know, we don't really sort of uh, take the time to live in the moment. Um, for me, it's about personalised learning going forward. I think organisations, there will always be a requirement for a core requirement of core learning. But increasingly, um, learners have different demands. They, they require different things for their jobs. They have different uh, uh, personalities, different learning speeds. So I think, uh, you know, for me, it's about how can technology be an enabler for personalised learning going forward and what can we do there? And, um, and, and for me, oh, I would totally agree, I'm afraid, I'm agreeing, I'm agreeing, sorry. Um, but personalised learning, it, it, when, when, when technology is used for learning, it, it, for people who aren't so, so savvy with technology, the immediate barrier is how can you make that personalised? It's a you know it's a virtual um, virtual classroom. What what you're showing is is not personalised. Well, I've got a bit of background noise. Um, um, so how can you make it personalised? And um, some of the technology that's about today can actually really unlock personalisation. And I don't mean you know. Um, you enrol onto courses. What I mean is, you you carry out a diagnostic which tells you where you are on your part on your career pathway or your, your professional development pathway, um, and and having that career path set out in front of you and showing you where you are on that pathway is immensely powerful for for you as an individual. And then. Um, unlocking specific areas where you want to develop your skills is incredibly important but then also being able to look at your pet peers follow other people who are doing really well in your so, say someone's doing really well in your company they've had two promotions in two years you can actually collaborate with them or follow them in the same way you would LinkedIn or, or Facebook to actually see what they're doing which has enabled them to move up in, within the organisation with such power. Um, and so that's where gaming comes in, which again, I think the more we bring gaming in or the, or the, the theory of gaming, so stages, unlocking stages, you're into the next stage, you, you know, you've passed that, unlock the next stage. The more we bring gaming in, the more powerful, I think, personalised learning can, can be for an individual. Yeah, I mean, pers per personalization, I, I think, really interesting, because you only have to look outside, again, look outside our industry, and looking at obvious things, just, you know, how Google, Facebook, LinkedIn knows so much about us, going back to your data point. Now, we might have questions about what they do with that data, but as learning development people, we can do really positive things with it in order to help, I mean, a lot of it will be smart algorithms and massive data and how you make, you know, the real smarts under the bonnet. But it really is about being able to, not just in terms of mapping out a career path, but actually saying, you know what, you've got a problem here. Somebody else had that yesterday. And in the moment, being able to offer the answer. And I think... Um I wanted to buy a new shed a few weeks ago, sounds really exciting, um, but before I knew it, in my email side, and my everything was, was showing me sheds, just fantastic how that works. Um, so the intelligent web, I think, Charles, is absolutely spot on. When learners can actually start cert using search engines, and it's coming up with intelligent links to help you connect to communities or other content, I think that's coming fairly soon. So I think that's really important. I think if I had a punt on technology, I'd say the smartphone is probably where we're going. When we say the future, tomorrow is the future, as is 10 years' time. So I kind of have this challenge between wearables, which are down the line because they're quite expensive, and what I do tomorrow. Now, the smartphone is where I think this is going in the, in the near future. So Apple have, have, have seen that, the drop-off in the, the purchase of iPads and an increase in smartphones. So I think we've got a real challenge on the personalization as to how we deliver uh, personal learning to the devices which everybody has. 
Uh, and I think that's a real challenge. That's a challenge in terms of the interface, and you guys are real specialists on that, but it's the interface, but it's, it's delivering learning to this device. Morgan Stanley did a bit of research to say that only 50% of mobiles are used for calls and texting now. Only half of them, so the other half are being used for all this funky stuff, and L&D needs to be in that funky space as well. When you say this device, put your hand up again, because you've got, you've got a pair of specs in your hand as yeah. well as a smartphone. But as, you, as you, but as you get old, I mean, a serious comment on that one. As yeah. you get older, and I'm probably, you d I'm not going to tell you how old I am, you need a pair of specs to work on a smartphone. That's, that's the reality. So I'll challenge you as Brightwave, you need to be designing interfaces where people can work on a smartphone who maybe have got reading. You know, that's the reality we want to get in, where, where this technology is used for learning, whatever your uh, scenario might be. So, um, yeah, glasses and smartphone. Absolutely proud of that. Who else has reading glasses here? Yeah, come on, most of us do. Charles, you're too young. Oh, I know, right. but okay. listen, yeah, what yeah. about combining them? Absolutely, there we go. So that's where Although technology is to go. it's interesting that Google seemed to have um, sort of had a bit of a pause on Google Glass. I, I, I don't know if you've come across that. But inevitably, yeah. wearable technology is, gonna, is going to be with us. I mean, technology only removes the barriers to things that we need to do anyway. It re reduces friction. You see it all the time. There's an obvious remaining friction with a smartphone, which is that you have to hold it and you have to use your thumbs and fingers voice recognition isn't quite there yet anyway we could get excited about new gadgets for the rest of the day but unless anyone else has got any other the comments the only thing i'd say as well is multi-channel my son runs three devices at a time in the evenings i can manage one so i think we've got to get used to multi-channel learning and being comfortable with that in the in the workplace um, this is this is something of a plea and a challenge. I, I hope maybe this is because I haven't spent enough time walking around here. But I think there's there's a, an immediate innovation that's available now, in what I would call content formats, which is how do you present content in a useful, compelling manner that leads a learner through something, with enough intrigue and interest and detail that you feel like you've got something out of it. This is not an e-learning module. This is not a fun. Um, and there's some interesting things happening with what I think journalism, they call them explainer formats. So the Guardian, the New York Times, there's a, I think a maybe a South African or Australian company called Shorthand doing some really interesting scrolling detailed pages, different, different content um, fed in, video, audio, some interaction. That notion of a guide format is really important for all of us. Yeah. And, it's, and, it, and it's happening now, in fact. No, I, I'm glad you said that because I, I, I do agree very much. And it actually goes back to your question about you know the different skills and cousins in marketing and particularly journalism that we can look there as, le as instructional designers and see how they first of all they need to get stuff out quickly and they curate content they don't necessarily spend masses of time turning it into into you know, sophisticated learning instructionally designed stuff I, I would say um, Pat, I don't know this might be a more of a controversial point but I, I worry that instructional design makes it hard because if journalists do this really well, they're not interested in instructional design, but they can tell a very good story very completely. And if you try and layer instructional design over it, actually, maybe that's a layer of complication we don't need. Well, maybe controversially, I could say that instructional design is for the employer to ensure everybody gets fed the same stuff in a consistent, structured way, and nothing's missed out, and then you have a test at the end. Now, that is still valid, perhaps, I, for certain subjects, for certain things where people do need to do the same thing yes, in I a routine I, way. I think that's correct. Um, and I, I think that's part of, I guess, you know, uh, maybe this is a kind of a BBC preoccupation. We call that kind of editorial standards. So everything meets a certain standard because it's a certain kind of thing. And you, and you don't publish it unless it's met that standard. Yeah. I think that the risk with that, that sort of e learning module instructional design approach is you create the kind of mandatory training ghetto in the LMS that everything looks and feels like that and people don't choose to go there because it all looks and feels like that. Ah, uh, the LMS. We haven't really talked about Sorry, the LMS, the, have we? That was yeah, a blast from the past, <laughs> not the future, perhaps. Well, I don't know. I think the, the parts of the LMS are going to be here to stay for those reasons where you do need to track certain things and report on them. But as we've been discussing today, real learning goes a long way. Uh, total learning goes way beyond just uh, the LMS. So we're getting towards the end of our time. Did you, did any, uh, anybody w want to comment again on, on that particular question? question? What opportunities will technology, new technologies that we can start to see emerging present to us, learning development people? Any, co any comments? Perhaps you could pass the microphone over to that lady there. 
Um, I'm probably going to be sound the day, um, the gloomsayer here. But every single chip in every single device takes 72,000 litres of water to produce. Every phone, every iPhone, every iPad. Now, in 17 years' time, when the world... And I know this is possibly isn't going to hit the West quite as much when we're running out of water. I take your point about digital poverty, which I think is excellent. We do forget that people don't have access. But 2030 isn't very far away. And I just really worry about technology and the ability of the world to keep on producing these devices. Okay, no, that's a fair point. You might, might counter that, actually, by um, pointing out just how much we can save in things like travel by using technology for learning. But that's another debate, I think. Any, any other questions? Hi, thank you. Um, I'm just re responding to the, the, the lady's question uh, or, or comment there, um, and I think it's just I think we just need to um, remember that technology is an enabler, and it's more about what we need to do, and it's more about the social and the connections, and and what we need to learn from each other, and just use the technology that's available to us, because the danger is we can actually go down too far down the technology route, and forget about what we actually need to do. To, to learn. Yeah, I mean, I, I, I agree with that. And, and um, for me, technology is just making what we want to do easier. And, and it's fascinating and fantastic because of that. And, and uh, you know, in all, in all sorts of things, you know, getting from A to B has got easier and easier and quicker over the last 200 years. And you can, you can think of all sorts of other examples. And I was just going to say, I think the role of training still exists as the head of L&D at CIPD. Um, because companies still need to train their staff to do skills and that might be a checklist, uh, it might be a job aid. So I think you're absolutely right, we need to look at the full spectrum. Uh, but we need to look, I think, how you're absolutely right, how technology connects people. My phone's buzzing like crazy here on the back channel. So that's fantastic, isn't it? Yeah, absolutely fantastic. And I think to the point on sustainability, I think it's also cool that African farmers can use their mobile phones to make sure they get the right price for their grain as well. So technology can work both ways, but I'm totally with you on that one, yeah. I, th I think you're absolutely right. I think that um, technology is an enabler. It's not a magic bullet. I think the, the, the organisations that, that uh, deploy it and uh, learners that use it also have a responsibility. You can um, source the most fantastic whiz-bang technology in the world, but actually if your organisation doesn't support it by um, culturally or organisationally or by allowing your learners the time to use it, it's not going to work, no matter how fantastic it is. So I think you're absolutely right. It's one part of the puzzle, not the whole thing. OK, I've got a big question here. Um, we've been talking about learners that are engaged. What advice have you got for if you've got learners, maybe older learners, that are actually quite disengaged with technology and also disengaged with their own learning? Um, and they don't see their own learning paths and, and so on. So, advice. Um, yeah, well, I think a lot of organisations are, are struggling with this one. I, I think it's interesting to see some, some of the uses of, of social technology becoming completely democratic now, certainly in most, you know, in, in, in what you might call developed countries. So something like Facebook has a pretty much a mainstream application now. So I think well-designed products that have a user need in mind can overcome the technophobia the anxiety I think the point is and this is more about this you know this, this notion that it's not about the technology it's about the relevance it's about what the technology does that's relevant for people and I think that that feels to me that, that, that that's the challenge and it may be that for those people who feel less engaged it's not the technology that's the problem it's the content exactly um, and, and you need to make the content more relevant for them and if there are in a lot of organizations now if there is a demographic like that in your workforce then I think it's a relevance challenge, not a technology problem. Um, and I, I'd hope that if I ever had a problem like that, that's how I'd, ch I'd tackle it, I hope. That's what I told my boss yesterday anyway. So. I, I think it's about multiple access. Now, there's a budget issue on this one because we haven't got limitless budgets, but um, using a map, you can get to the destination in different ways. So maybe, and um, I copyright this one right now because I just thought of it as I'm sitting here, um, maybe a map is a multiple access point to learning and you need to take different routes. So that's Andy Lancaster's one. Anybody tweeting that one? Uh, if that appears as a product in the next five minutes, it's mine. Um, but older learners, some are great on technology. Some of the fastest uh, growing groups of users of technology are, are seniors now, but you're absolutely right. And we have 
digital poverty. Some of the young people are really struggling. So I, th I think we've got to try and have this personalised approach, which we're all saying, where we allow people to learn in a really meaningful way to them. And I think the more we do that, the more success we'll have. Uh, it's a big challenge. Um, there's no doubt most organisations are struggling to engage all their staff. But that's, that's the role of the modern L&D person, to be a facilitator of those kind of things. Um, I, th I think it's probably a little bit more um, ingrained than that um, from what I've seen from, from our membership and um, from the guy I'm married to actually. Um, he, he hates technology. He hates it. He hates phones. He hates um, uh, computers. Um, and then about a year ago, uh, I, we got an iPad, amazing, in the house, laid on the table. It's very cool. Um, and he avoided it. It was almost like there was a plague sitting on the table and he refused to go near it um, until one day I showed him the benefit of this iPad, which was it could show him the football scores as they were coming in. Okay, so he didn't have to go on teletext. Do you remember that? <laughs> teletext. Yeah, so he used to use teletext. Now he uses the iPad to get his football results and his horse racing results and look at his lottery results and buy his lottery ticket. And he actually sent a text the other day. It was incredible. So um, it's not so much about whether someone... If the, if the technology is there, they'll use it. It's the fear factor around the technology. Mm. And it's that... It's enabling that person to make that first step in seeing that actually this is going to have worth and value for you if you start using it. And, um, and that's a bigger, I think that's a bigger challenge that we've yeah. got than just giving them lots sure. of opportunity. Surely the answer is to be able to design stuff that allows you to see past the technology, making it as invisible as, as possible. It's not a barrier. That, that's got to be the answer. Well, I think all I was going to say is that you know, we're working with um, a number of clients who are you know, early adopters of new technology. And for us, engagement doesn't sort of start at the point at which you issue the course or the, or the technology. It actually starts much, much earlier. It's a longer journey, and it's a specific journey of, of success and engagement. It's distinct, I think, from the technology question. It's about um, making sure that the content is, is appropriate and correct for your audience, which I think is Charles's point. And also about how the organization then um, manages the introduction of that content or that technology and then guides and handholds the learners through their particular journey. It's about comms, it's about launch and it's about post-launch activity as well I think. It's all part of a sort of a, a, an engagement pathway not just a here it is, please use it. Brilliant, I think that's a great uh, note on which to end. I mean there, I'm sure that this discussion can, could carry on and we'd love to continue it with you actually so do, do come and talk to us. But I'd like to, to thank um, our four panellists. Thank you very much. And I'd like to uh, invite anybody who wants to come and talk further about this idea of total learning and any other things that we've been discussing uh, to come and see us uh, just over here at the Brightwave stand. 